just first of all, a big thank you for everyone for just taking some time out of your day for this session. Um, today, as you know, we're going to be talking about how we can build truly engaged audiences without overly splashing out. And then more importantly, how we can do that in a way where we see real commercial benefits to each of our businesses. So this is a challenge that, that we hear comes up continuously from our community. So we're absolutely delighted that we, we've got around to, to pulling this session together. Um, and we're doing it with our friends at, at Twilio, um, who are the leading cloud communications platform. So today uh, we're joined by Sam Richardson, who you'll see on your screen. Um, he'll share a bit about what they do, but also what they've seen really work, some of the pitfalls that SMEs fall into to really just give us that advice and guidance on, on how we can do it in the most effective way possible. Um, we're also joined today by Tess, who you'll see on your screen, the CEO and co-founder of Bayer Fertility. Um, I think quite a few of you will recognize her from the uh, documentary Founders Changing the World. Um, but effectively, Tess is going to be taking part in a, a fireside chat with Sam just to ask some of the questions that I know will be on, on all of our minds as we go. Um, and as always, we'll, we'll do questions for everyone at the end as well. So if you put any questions you have in the chat, we can, uh, we can get to those at the end um, as well. But first off, I think, Sam, you're going to kick us off um, with a bit about yourselves, a bit about what you've seen really work. Hopefully we can get some, some advice as well. So over to you. Oh, thanks, James, and thanks for um, thanks for inviting me. And it's great to be here. I feel quite inspired by all these people doing amazing things. It's um, yeah. Thanks very much. I'm going to share my screen. A um, few slides today, just to kind of structure the conversation a bit. Um, so we really wanted to talk about the rules of engagement because I think you know, customer engagement is such a hot topic, and especially in the last two years, right? organizations of all sizes have been adding loads of different channels and I think what we're really seeing is we've come to this crunch time where we are really helping organizations think about what they what they need uh, what channels they need how best to communicate and how best to engage people and when we set about thinking about what these rules should be as always happens right it's not the most they're not the most glamorous things but hopefully what I can talk you through today are some really good solid principles to make sure that um, you know you're engaging in the right way and also that it, it you can engage as you scale and grow without it really costing you in terms of your margin or your back office costs more on that more on that in a bit um, first of all a little bit about me um, so my name's Sam I have a very fancy job title uh, really it means that I help organizations of all different shapes and sizes think about the their future engagement strategy and really think about that future kind of customer management as well i've had 20 plus years doing this for again a huge variety of organizations looking at their customer experience strategy their transformation often what it's really meant is that I've helped uh, companies get out of the sticky situations that they found themselves in because they haven't really planned ahead and thought about how they want to engage. Um, so I'll share a bit of that with you today as well. So uh, today we're going to touch on why creating consistency from the start will help you scale. We're also going to touch on um, why deepening relationships is vital and how you should deepen relationships. And we're really going to look at trust as well, because this is really overlooked as a component of engagement. And yet time and time again, you know, trust ends up being one of the absolute table stakes in terms of the longevity of relationship that you have with your customers. So a little bit about. Um, I think I jumped ahead then. Right, here we go. A little bit about Twilio. I missed, I missed an important bit there. So uh, Twilio is one of those companies that you may not have heard of, but you're probably touching every single day. So we're the communications layer of the internet. And last year we put more than um, a trillion digital transactions through our platforms. So think about when you call an Uber um, and you're trying to communicate with the driver, that's us behind that. That's us powering that communication. We do a lot more than that. Um, we are really focused on helping 
builders be able to create differentiation with their customer experience. So our platform is not a solution. It's a combination of many APIs that you can use in whatever way it is that you need to in order to build that customer experience that you're looking for. Um, and, you know, I've said it before, we work with an enormous variety of customers, whether it be organizations like yourselves who are quite early on in their journey or those that have really matured. And that's a, a, those digital native companies that have matured is a huge proportion of who we deal with, the likes of the Ubers and the Airbnbs and um, you know, a lot of the delivery and rideshare companies, and then some of the big enterprises as well. So we, we get to see a lot as to what's going on. Um, so just kind of kicking this off, you know, relationships are and always have been at the core of um, thriving organizations that hasn't changed and I don't think really our needs have changed either as customers we need to be seen and known we need our resolution we need our issues resolving quickly um, and we need to be communicated with in a way that makes us that, that really drives that loyalty they haven't changed but they have got tougher now because you know we have these magic phones in our hand all the time which means that we are looking for quicker resolutions. We want to speak to people on the channels that we want to speak to them at. I did some work in China a couple of years ago and um, the Chinese consumer expects a response within 10 seconds on most of their channels. And that is an enormous job to service on the back end when you're looking at that kind of scale of things. So there have certainly been huge changes in the way that we expect to be communicated to by organizations. Um, I think it's also interesting, this is a always an interesting stat for me, because 94%, most businesses think that they're doing a great job. They think they're sending out great marketing, they think that they're engaging with customers how they want to be engaged with, resolving issues, but the reality is most customers disagree. And I think that this is also where a misconception can happen because we think that we have to always be there with like the latest and greatest and most dazzling content. And whilst that can be true, in, in reality, what we really want is consume as consumers is to have our issues resolved or to find answers that we're looking for really quickly. So I think this misconception is really interesting. And, you know, keep that in mind as you're really building out your um, customer engagement strategy, because you need to think about what it is your customers are looking for from you, not so much what you want to push out from your push out to your customers. So getting on to uh, the four rules or principles, the first one is about knowing your customer. And this falls into two camps. So the first is around that personalization. You know, we've come to expect those kind of great Netflix and Amazon experiences. You know, we expect customers, uh, organizations to know more about us than we know about themselves. And that is a fantastic uh, market, marketing and, you know, lead generating um, engagement strategy. But then, there's also another element to this engagement strategy, which is when customers, when you are communicating with customers or they're engaging with you for some reason, it's really important to re weave in what you know about your customer into the messages that you send. It could be an email about what they've bought. It could be, you know, referring to um, a resolution, an issue that they've had and hoping that it's been resolved. Just make sure that whatever you're building into your content strategy, you're able to weave in what you already know about your customers. This will also build trust, which is the most important pillar of the rules that I'm going to talk to you about today. I remember working with a, a financial services company and none of the communication that they were having with customers mentioned like the customer name or a product that they had with them. And that was really pivotal in that you know, breaking that line between trusting the company and investing with them or not, because, you know, we're, we're so wary of uh, scams and all these things coming up that it's really important to demonstrate that you do know who you're talking to. Again, another pitfall that organizations fall into is that as customers are contacting on a variety of different channels, you don't know them in that particular channel, or you don't know, you don't recognize them in a way that um, they need to be responded to. So I think knowing your customer, whilst from a marketing perspective is always important, 
from um, an, a real engagement and service perspective probably is even more important because when you don't do that, it's just a poor service. Nobody wants to have to repeat themselves all the time, you know, especially not now that we know all this data is stored. So this is a really important one to bear in mind. The next is around security and as we see you know more and more channels being added and more digital channels being added especially security is becoming paramount and you know we did we did a lot of work during the pandemic adding video sms channels a variety of things and what came hand in hand with that was also talking about security and again this falls into a few different buckets so we've got the cyber security and you know we and there's that element to it there's also the element of knowing and trusting that on both sides of the fence the person you're talking to really is the person that you think you're talking to and this is and you do this by you know one time passcodes verification look up there's all sorts of different ways that you can do that but it's really important for both sides because fraud diminishes um, trust organization customers will have in your organization it costs you a lot of money but equally your customers need to know that they're speaking to you last year in the summer in the uk 45 million scam sms messages were sent so that's just three months in the uk 45 million and two percent of those were responded to it's a huge problem that is only going to get bigger. You need to make sure that whatever channels you're using, they are known, they're branded. So if it's a phone call you're making, make sure it's a branded call, make sure it's a branded SMS, make sure it's a branded WhatsApp. You know, this will give customers confidence then that they really are dealing with you and that you're not a scam. Um, the other part is data transparency as well. Often, it's a value exchange, right? You need more data from your customer in order to provide a better service, but they need to trust you in order to make sure that you're taking care of the data. Again, it, it's this two-way relationship and this value exchange to make sure that you're getting what you need from them, um, especially if you're working in an area like financial services or health. It's, it's absolutely paramount. You know, I probably can't state this enough. Security has, what we're seeing is security has become table states. And it will only increase to become more and more important. Do this right now, and it will definitely save you in the long run. The next is around confidence. And this is really about your the, the, the confidence that your customer has that you can meet their needs, but also that you can service them and resolve an issue if it comes up. We did, <coughs> excuse me, we did a piece of um, analysis a couple of years ago where we were looking at the ride share and delivery companies because that's a big sector for us and what we found was that um, we were really looking at like profitability and things like that which is a hot topic in that industry anyway and what we found was that a lot of these organizations that had grown and scaled really quickly were barely making any money because of the amount it cost them in the back office so when you look at a lot of these companies that seem like digital native companies from the outside, actually what's sitting behind there has ended up being enormous contact centers, often outsourced. It, it's a huge cost. We also know that, that if there's an issue, you know, more than 55% of customers will have to call twice. They will use multiple channels. All of this is just piling cost into your service operation and eating away at your margin. Any wrinkle that you've got now will end up costing you either with loss of customers or a very high cost to serve and eating into your margin in the long run if you don't sort them out. And as I say, we deal with a lot of customers across all sectors who kind of been disruptors they've been digital native companies and now they're on a maturity curve as they've expanded and the problem that they invariably come to us with is how do we sort out all this volume how do we sort out all of this um, contact that we're getting from customers 
And I get it, it's not a priority as you're going through the funding because it's not necessarily what investors are looking for, but this is the thing that you really have to be sharp on because it will, it, it can make or break your business in terms of cost. So making sure that from the start, you are able to resolve customers' queries, you are able to keep a lid on the number of times that they will contact you by building that reassurance, being proactive with them that you are on their issue, you are going to resolve it, you are, you know, keeping them informed as to what's going on, again, will absolutely save you in the long run. And leading on from that is the final rule, which is really about equipping everybody to make sure that they can answer any kind of queries or questions that they've got. In every touch point, customers are looking to solve a problem or looking to have a question answered. You need to make sure your self-service is really consistent, that your knowledge is up to date that across any channel a customer might choose, whether it be a website, whether it be FAQs, your app, whether they, you've chosen to you know, put a bot on your WhatsApp channel or something like that, it needs to be the same answer. And this needs to be the same answer that your customer service people can also give. Again, what we see time and time again is that customer service people just are aren't equipped to answer the questions because they haven't got the information at their fingertips. And it's that, that some simplicity and speed to resolution that will really deepen that relationship and uh, create loyal customers in the long term. And this is quite tricky to do because it needs to be done across multiple channels as well. Um, you know, we find that WhatsApp is fantastic for service and it's a huge channel that's growing because customers are really familiar with it. It's working for B2B as well as B2C, but you need to be making sure that any bot that you build on there, because you can build great automation with it, that it, it needs to be simple, but it also needs to answer the question. And you need to make sure that those handoff points are really clean so that if they need to speak to somebody, they can speak to a human and just chat with them. You know, there's also an element of this um, around the channels that you choose that goes back to the trust, right? Because you don't want to, WhatsApp's great for servicing, SMS is great for immediacy, phone calls are great for even more urgency. You need to be careful about what channel you're using for what service that you're putting on it, um, for what service you're putting on, because if you're using WhatsApp for servicing, you don't want to then bombard marketing channels down it. It breaks the trust. If you're using SMS for the immediacy of appointment reminders, um, delivery notifications, whatever it might be, again, you need to um, make sure that that's a really effective channel for you if you're spending money on it. So think about the marketing messages that you're putting through to it. You know, there's a lot to consider when you're building out all of these channels and thinking about these four rules that go with them. And I think, you know, in summary, these are, if you, if you use these four rules or these four principles, you won't go far wrong when you're thinking about the engagement strategy that you're building out. The other thing that I would say is that it's really better to do less and do it really well because there's so much available, because we're using so many channels now, we're seeing a tendency for organizations to just keep adding channels. But if you're adding channels, you have got to make sure that they are consistent, that the resolution can, they can be serviced well, you can resolve on those channels, the information is available. Otherwise, all you're doing is kind of opening up a whole world of contact and service that you just can't handle and that really ends up distracting you from what you should be doing, which is building a great organization based on the product or service it is that, that you're selling. Um, so less is, less is definitely more. It's often a hard conversation to have with people, but it really, even if you're just sticking with an email channel can be really effective if it's done really well and you're responding well to it. You know, just, just be very intentional about what it is you're building and how you're building those communications. Um, and I think then hopefully you won't go far wrong. But if you ever have any questions, I'm here, you know, always happy, 
always happy to answer those. Um, it's a whistle stop tour, James, over a huge subject. Uh, I think we could dive into each of these and spend you know, an afternoon on each of them themselves. But um, hopefully that's kind of given you a few things to think about um, when it comes to building out your own engagement strategies. Absolutely. And I think that's a, a great overview and some incredible stats in there as well. I think the one I found most almost shocking is, what was it, 94% of, of businesses think they're doing a great job and 92% of customers disagree. Yeah. Which is uh, obviously a massive disconnect. So look, I, I'm keen that we we dive a bit more into this. Um, you'll see Tess has just popped up on your screens. Um, I should say Tess was under the impression that she was just attending today up until about 48 hours ago. Um, <laughs> but we, th we thought it's, uh, it's always good to, to bring a founder in to really ask from, from our, all of our points of view. Um, the questions that we're dying to ask. So Tess, I don't know if you want to give just a quick overview of your business to give some context to some of the questions, and then I will leave it to you to, to dive into it with Sam. Of course, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Tess. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO of Bayer Fertility. We are building fertility treatments that are accessible so and affordable. The idea being that in a world where more and more of us need support and help as we start our families. Access to care has actually never been lower. Um, and so we're trying to fix that and address that gap by building uh, fertility treatments that people can do at home in a safe way. And so we're, we're still pre-market. My colleague, Nicole, our chief marketing officer, is uh, also listening in on this. And I could just hear her thinking from the room next door. But uh, as an early stage startup operating in people's lives at a really vulnerable time. Sam, that was incredible. There was a lot in there that I'm very keen to dive into. Great, right. thanks. Okay, far away. Far away. So uh, what a couple, I jot, jotted down a couple of notes. I'm sort of looking at my notebook, but uh, you talked about knowing your customer um, and, and weaving in things that you have uh, gleaned about them along the way as a part of sort of knowing them and building trust. but. When we're talking to customers, I do, I get that personalization is key, but where is the boundary between uh, respecting a customer's privacy and, and chasing personalization? And particularly, you know, in fertility, we catch people where they tell us things that are deeply private. Do we want to be throwing that back to them? Um, so what's that, that balance between personalization and, and respecting privacy? Where do you think that lies? Well, I think I think it's really interesting. And, and again, as we're finding our way with data and personalization, it's been quite a hot topic. Um, so hot, in fact, that there's new European rulings about it, which means that you can't take any third party data now. It has to all be first party data. So I think that that's the first step, right? Making sure that all your data is first party data, i.e. the customer, your customer has consented to you having that data and using that data. And I think that that's a really important part in drawing that line in the sand between what's acceptable and then what ends up being quite creepy because none of us want to have, none of us like it when we've been searching for something and then all of a sudden it's in every single web browser that we look at and you know we had a few even I've had a few incidences where I've been on conversations and then Google is all of a sudden showing me adverts for things that I've been talking about that is definitely a step too far. And that is that third party data collection, which through new rulings is actually being, you know, outlawed, you know, you have to have that first party data. I think the second thing, especially in a something as sensitive as in your case, it is being absolutely intentional about that communication that you're having and put it's amazing how many organizations still don't put themselves in the shoes of their customer and think about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate how would I feel how would I feel about receiving this notification that's completely inappropriate given my circumstances one of the things I do like that's been a shift is the change in um, messaging around like Mother's Day Father's Day any of these kind of things we've become a lot more aware and a lot more sensitive now that actually there's somebody on the receiving end of that information um, and I, I think it's, it's, it's those two things, you know, really taking care of your data and at the same time being 
very intentional and imagining at the end of that communication there's a customer there how would they feel i mean you must have a bit of that in the organization that you work with i'm guessing that the data and the communications you send out have got to be so sensitive and important i'm interested in how you deal with it yeah so uh we're, we're very much pre-market so because we are um a few months off launch we didn't really want to double down on communication because there's a bit of a sensitivity issue in that if you're trying to conceive and you're waiting to conceive do you want to wait nine months for us to get on the market or do you want to try and and get pregnant and and go so we've had to sort of balance how we communicate ahead of getting product on the market. But I think, you know, to, to your point on there's a customer there, put yourself in people's shoes. We we obviously all subscribe to all of the menstrual tracking apps and, and, and sort of try and know the industry really well. And people in the team will regularly get notifications that say, oh, hey, first name, you know, are you feeling bloated today? You might be pregnant. And it just pops up on your home screen, you know, in a world where Maybe you just miscarried. Maybe you're not trying to get pregnant. Imagine getting a notification like that Sunday morning at 10 a.m. So I know, you know, I, I regularly actually see examples of companies doing this in a way that is completely disastrous. It's rare that you see someone doing it well. It really is. It really um, is. It really is. But to that point, Sam, uh, you know, speaking, and I know a lot of people who are on this call will be relatively young, relatively new companies. Is it possible to build up trust quickly? I mean, there was a stat, James, you pulled it out. I love it. The 94% of, of businesses think they do a great job. 92% of people disagree. How, you know, how can we build trust? And is it possible to do it really quickly? Or does it just take time? It takes time to build that deep, loyal kind of relationship. But there are ways that you can build trust relatively quickly. For example, um, making sure, so one of the companies that we've worked with has developed this great process, which is for um, like a, a click and collect or a delivery, they always use a one-time passcode. So you have to match your one-time passcode, your four or five, you know, you get them with PayPal and things, don't you? You have to match that with the person that's delivering. So, you know, that it's they are who they say they are and it's and it's really secure well that's a simple way to build up trust pretty quickly <coughs> excuse me i think another one is also showing it is that branded those branded elements that i was talking about so if you're if you choose whatsapp as a channel make sure it's branded and not just a telephone number because that's mm -hmm. another way that you can build up trust showing that you know parts of your that you know bits of your customer you know that you refer to a previous conversation that you had that's a really quick way to deepen that intimacy and deepen that trust and i also think making sure that you resolve an issue that comes up is another way to deepen the trust you know it's there are ways that you can quickly start to build a start the foundations of a trusting relationship with your customer i think it's if you make sure you're considering it with every touch point that you have, then that really will reap its benefits because then you've never broken it. It becomes a deep and loyal relationship, especially in a business like you're in, right? Because it relies a lot on trust. You know, you're trusted with the data that you've got, trust in how they're communicating. It, 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 trust is such a table stake for you. That I think it, it can only happen over time, but there's definitely short term things that you can do to make sure that you're building it right from the start. Speaking of table stakes, you talked about security uh, becoming table stakes for most customers. And I think there was a statistic about 80, 86% of people who would um, move away from a, a business if they didn't trust them from a security perspective. But uh, from my perspective, and I, if anyone else sort of on the call has a different view on this, but you just tick the box that says, uh, sure, I agree, and then you move on. It, it, I'm not sure how I would think about security and transparency and privacy unless there was a mistake or a breach. And then obviously you think about it, but is there a way, that, have you ever seen an example of companies proactively communicating about their security and, and leveraging that? Thank you. Financial services is an obvious case it's a way to start with all of this, right? And um, increasingly, we're seeing more and more of this. We take your data very seriously. We take you very seriously. And here's what we're doing. So in our, we work with a lot of FinServe disruptors. 
and we do see that being a topic of conversation for them um that people are asking now how you, people are increasingly asking a bit more about how are you using my data how are you taking my data how are you using it what are you using it for i think that we're learning a lot more about that we kind of come out of the wild west of data and that trust whereby you know it was just being flown around everywhere and we're, we're becoming more astute about it um but but it's interesting because you're right we do just tick the box and then just assume that everything will be okay um I think we'll see more and more legislation around it, which hopefully will increase our awareness of what data is actually being used for. Um, and, and we'll see, I think, I think it's one of those things that in the next few years is going to be, it's going to be a must have on our checklist. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm going to change direction a little bit as uh, a founder and I'm sure, you know, anyone on this call who's, who's a founder will know that there's a certain degree of interacting one-on-one -on -one and sort of leading from the front and, and any of the founder-led brands out there. How do you balance that sort of one-on-one -on -one personal touch coming from, from a business and mass messaging? And actually is mass messaging, is it possible to make that personal and effective? Is it possible to leverage that? Excuse me. It's about, again, I think it's about the contact strategies that you build and knowing, and it's about knowing when to be really personal. I think that, um, I think Riverford do this really well. So they, um, during the pandemic, I was trying to get through a whole session without saying the P word, but it's impossible, isn't it? But during um, the pandemic, um, you know, there was all these short, there was the shortages of food. I subscribed to a river for box. What they were really good at doing is the mass communication over um, availability, over, um, you know, deliveries, over all of this shortages. They were really good at doing that. But then what they were really good at doing is we were hearing from the founder when we really needed to. So when there was shortages because so many of their staff had got hit by COVID, for example, that's when the founder stepped in and said, this is what's happening. I'm being really transparent. Um, you know, it, he, he is a great example of how to mix that mass messaging and some other automation. And a lot of what they with, you do with Riverford is self-serve, but then stepping in when you really need to, to reassure customers, to build that loyalty and also to have an opinion because you know, he has opinions. Sustainability is everything he does. And I, I think it's that balance, right, between understanding when it's critical to do that and when it's not. You know, if it's just an everyday transaction, if it if it's something that's relatively simple, there, there, there isn't a need for, for you test to message somebody about it, right? It's just every day, but it's thinking about those critical moments that matter. Unfortunately, it's normally if something's not quite right or something's gone wrong, that's when absolutely as a founder, you need to be communicating in a one-on-one -on -one with your customers because um, it's when it matters the most. And it, it's that moment that, again, you'll really turn people to become loyal. You said something, um as you were talking that really struck a chord with me, which was uh, a little bit about channel strategy and making sure that the channels you use in which you're to service customers versus marketing messages and striking the right balance. I personally thought that was fascinating and wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Any examples you've seen done well, any pitfalls or things to avoid there? Yeah, I think that the pitfall is definitely not using all channels for all things right I think it's really tempting to do that when really each channel has to be a it has its own content designed to it so for example we recently worked with an organization who were sending out sms messages for absolutely everything and sometimes they were having to send three sms messages to deliver one message and it's like, you really should be either condensing that or using email, <laughs> you know? 
sounds very obvious, but they weren't doing it and it was costing them a fortune. Equally, I think that WhatsApp is a fantastic channel for servicing, for that two-way conversation. In many respects, it's replacing like Messenger and chat and things like this, because if you're looking at live chat, you probably have to be on a desktop. You have to wait for a response. You know, it's not as asynchronous as we would really like it to be. WhatsApp's really asynchronous. We can just use that, you know, we, we use it in the same way that we use it in an everyday life. So I think it's really, the pitfall is not thinking about each channel in the way it should be thought about. An email is still a great source of sending offers of, you know, more long form content and information. Not so great for servicing. Yeah. Because we know that it's really hard to get a response from that. People don't always check their emails. They don't always look at it, you know, and, and if it's really urgent, the phone is still something that we rely on, you know, to get an answer and people don't use, pick up the phone and use it lightly. We know that we've been through everything else first before we've picked up the phone, but sometimes you just really need to make that call to get something resolved. And you need to know that when you've done that, that call is going to be resolved on it. So I think, you know, it's, I would definitely never use voice or WhatsApp for, I wouldn't use those for marketing because they're so good for servicing and getting resolution. I wouldn't really use email for servicing because sometimes it can work really effectively, but it also can end up being a really heavy lift on your side with having to respond to it. I mean, it, it's, I think it's fine as a, a short term solution. Um, an SMS is great when you want that immediacy, when you want to convey a message quickly about an order, about you want somebody to contact you. You know, there's still something like 92% response rates on um, SMS within a matter of hours. It's still a really good channel to get a response on, but it's best to use that when you are asking for a response from a customer. Okay. I feel that, that was a long-winded answer test because I could no, that was a great talk answer. about these things for a long time, but it really depends what you want. The thing is to keep in mind, not every channel, don't use every channel in the same way. Really think about them. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's, I completely agree. I've had experiences on WhatsApp customer service channels, for example, that have been really good and I've had some really awful ones, <laughs> really, really awful. And it's interesting how some companies manage to just nail it every time and some just can't quite get it right. So I was, I was curious about your experience in servicing versus marketing and how it applies to channels. So that was really helpful. Thank you. Um, Sherry, let's see. Oh, interesting question from Jerry. If I can hop in and pull this one out um on speaking with a person delivering better satisfaction but do you notice any age group differences in um how channels are used so this is one of my favorite questions because people have this misconception that uh, channels are generation based and whilst we know that um, certainly younger generations like to use, you know, WhatsApp and chat channels and social messenger and things like that. What we have seen, especially in the last two years, is a really large increase in the uptake of digital channels across all generations. Equally, we know from speaking to our customers <laughs> that um, we know from speaking to our customers that again if somebody wants a resolution they want a resolution so no matter what age you are you could well pick up the phone just to try and get that resolution i think previously we definitely saw big gaps in between older generations would always choose a phone call because that's what they were used to younger generations would use the more digital channels but we're still we're definitely seeing that blurring now that's interesting. Do you notice any trends between the type of business and the preferred channel? So medical companies versus, um, you know, wellness versus fashion versus grocery. Like, do, do certain industries track towards certain certain channels? 
Um, they do. I mean, they they do. I think for convenience, and it's more about the kind of channel, right? So if you're in the convenience sector, you want a quick answer, then, you know, or if you're a heavy app user, for example. So convenience, heavy app user, notifications, absolutely is a great way to go and to use that. You know, use, we haven't touched on that yet, but that is a is a brilliant channel to use because generally you're in there a lot anyway. So think like your Uber or your delivery, food delivery company or whatever, you know, it's a really effective channel. I think in terms of like the financial services and the um, more of the sort of health and life sciences, there's been a big movement towards video chat. Mm -hmm. So because these are deep, again, they're deeper relationships, there's not much more serious than money and health in our life. And we've seen an enormous uh, move to, to tele to, to video channels for that. I think, um, for retail, it depends on the sector that you're in, because if it's kind of the high commodity, low value, then again, the more sort of SMS, the, the cheaper channels to um, engage on are better. When we move up the value chain, then again, it tends to be more of the clientele, so more of that one-to-one -one video, the phone, the the more of more of that. So. There are definitely some some preferences, but I think it, it's just as much about sort of the sector you're playing in as the industry that you're playing in as well. So, so yeah, we do see some. Mm -hmm. I think Ralph raised a really interesting point in the chat on um, accessibility. Is there anything that you can speak to about the accessibility of certain channels over others and, and for companies that, that want to make sure that we're addressing all people? Is there anything that we should be thinking about there? Oh, yeah, that is a good question. Thanks for that, Rav. I'm just reading that now. Um, uh, this, yeah. Yeah, it can be. I think as, uh, accessibility is, I used to work for um, a company who did a lot with government digital services um, and that whole GDS approach in terms of making things as accessible as possible. Um, and I think that, um, that certainly for me was you know really educational in terms of how we do think about accessibility of channels again we see a lot of this um movement towards wholly digital channels which isn't necessarily again it's not necessarily right you even though i'm kind of saying use less channels you do need to make sure that you're considering people who might not be as here might not you know ac whatsapp does have accessibility issues might not have access to smartphones. We do a lot of work um, with our .org organization where people don't have access to data and to smartphones, so they can't do it. So again, I think it's about really understanding your customer and understand again, understanding who's at the end of the communications that you're receiving to make sure that you are communicating in a way that fits, that suits them. Um, Healthcare is a great example of this because I think, again, because of cost reasons, lots of healthcare providers have moved to only um, sending emails or interacting digitally. But as somebody that perhaps is going through treatment, is in a moment of high stress, can't necessarily have, doesn't necessarily have access to email, might be of a certain age that, you, you know, there, there is so much to think about in terms of how they receive those messages. Um, so I think that it is um, you're absolutely right. You really, not every channel is going to suit everybody. You need to make sure that you're thinking about those people who can access digital, who can't access digital, as well as as well as all of the um, other elements to it. And you do raise a good point there, Ralph. And um, yeah, I sure thank you for that. Yeah, no, it's a brilliant point. And um, Polly raised a, a really interesting question, Sam, where proactive engagement of people who perhaps are a customer on a, an ongoing subscription basis. So it's not necessarily a marketing message, but it's more of a proactive check-in, how are you doing kind of message. Um, you know, what channel would you recommend for that? I mean, you don't want one that's too, um, again, it's that issue that you talked about at the beginning, right? I think if you were just popping up on somebody's WhatsApp and saying, oh, hey, just checking in, how are you? Then that might seem a little bit odd. 
still, I mean, you know, email for proactive email is still a fairly is a fairly good channel for this, right? I think that um, email, if you've got again, if you're using an app and you, you've got an app service, I think that notifications are excellent for this. If you've got a secure messenger center, if you're in like healthcare or financial services and there's a secure messaging facility, I think this is excellent for it. Um, I think that those channels probably are the best to do that on. As I say, I, again, I'd avoid using anything that might seem a bit intrusive. Mm, agree. Yeah. yeah. Completely uh, agree. Thank you very much for that, Tess. You're a, you're a pro. You're a clear pro <laughs> at doing this. So we appreciate you jumping in for that. Um, Sam, one quick question for me. So we've, we've spoken a lot here about being on the right platforms at the right time for the right audiences. But we also know that trends seem to change within these platforms and where people sit. So as a rough guide, how frequently should we be reevaluating which platforms we're using and, and what are the things to keep in mind when we're doing that evaluation? Everybody's been reevaluating it, right? I think um, as they come up, I think you need to, you don't need to think about it all. It's not that you need to think about it all the time, but it is definitely worth a check in. You know, as we see the rise in things like we had that boom with um, Telegram and thinking about the wider world, people were using Line more, people moving away from Facebook. I think you need to be thinking about those kind of things as they come up. If you build out a 12 to 18 month strategy and then you're reviewing it as you go along, then you know I think that that is, is a fairly solid approach. I still, I would always look at the cost as well. So really keep focused on where you're getting the best um, response rates where you're getting the best open rates what's costing you the most to service on other ways that you can think about utilizing different channels in different ways if they end up costing you more i think you that contact strategy you 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 all you always have to be looking at it really and looking at the data i think it sits within the data look at what's working for you what's not working for you what's costing you don't be adding in all of that cost to serve in the back office because um, you know it 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 will just hurt you in multiple ways. So it kind of feels like a non-answer, James. But look at the data and see what it's telling you constantly, and then keep reevaluating it. And also do your research and know your your end customer as well. Same thing, data. Know your end customer. Understand what their preferences are and how they like to be communicated to. Think about accessibility you know it, it's it's always about reviewing that data perfect and we are just about out of time this session has flown by and so we seem to have, have packed a, a fair bit in as well so sam any last bits of advice or any to summarize what what are the key things you think people should be taking away from this i i think just be really intentional about what you're doing because what we see is people not being intentional, just adding the channels, not thinking about it, not thinking about the communication, the content and what they're putting on it. And the, so the thing I would say is just be really intentional and always keep your eye on it. Perfect. Well, Sam, thank you so, so much for that. And um, thank you to the rest of the Twilio team as well. I know we've got Virtue on the call who has put in a, a hell of a lot of work behind the scenes to, to put this session together. So thank you very much to you as well. Tess, you're awesome. Thanks for stepping up last minute. Um, we always appreciate that and good to have you involved. And of course, thank you to everyone else for, for taking time out of their day to, uh, to take part in this session. Of course, there is so much more we could dive into this. I think, um, Sam, just from what you're saying, each part of this, we could probably spend a full hour on. So um, we, we do have other sessions coming up. So we're actually going to host a, a physical session um, in just a couple of weeks with uh, with Sam and the Twilio team, um, where we can get into just that bit more detail and, and maybe get into some examples around the table as well. So looking forward to that. Um, of course, we have, have other sessions as well. We have a, a pitch night in the meantime. So if you're not signed up for that, it's a, a virtual session. Make sure you do. Um, and we hope to see you there. But in the meantime, enjoy the rest of your day. And, uh, and we look forward to catching up very soon.